are going to be in Ephesians chapter 6, and we have been looking at the weapons of warfare. Ephesians chapter 6 from, verses, from verse 10, and we are reading on to verse 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that he may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins good about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We're going to stop there. Over the last couple of weeks, we have been looking, we have been exploring what is identified or what is called by the Apostle Paul, the armor of God. And he said that a purpose for him given this armor is so that we will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We're going to be able to stand against the deceptive devices of the enemy. I believe sincerely that what Paul has given us is a solution as it pertains to how we can win this battle that we are faced with on a day-to-day -day basis. As believers, we are faced with challenges. As believers, we are faced with the enemy coming up against us. This, what Paul wrote here, is not for people now, uh, who, who have no, are now coming to wonder if it is that they want God in their life. This is written to people who have accepted Christ and who have decided that Jesus Christ is their Lord and their master. This text was not an evangelistic text. It was one for maturing believers. Amen? It was one to help us to recognize that as believers in Christ Jesus, we are going to be faced with challenges. And some of the challenges we're going to be faced with are called principalities. They are called powers. They are called spiritual wickedness in high places. They are called the rulers of the darkness of this world. And these are the things that we are faced with. But God has given us a solution. And the solution is called the armor of God. And he gave us, in this armor, there are six elements of the armor. Some say seven. We're going to take it as six for now, and then we're going to manage the other one a little later on. Is that okay? But there are six identific identifiable articles of this armor. And we say that they are truth, they are righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, and the word of God. These are the six uh, uh, items of the armor. And what we recognize is that what Paul did is that he, he kind of gave a nice analogy or an illustration as it pertains to how we can look at this from a practical uh, standpoint. How we can see it as a Roman soldier armor. So the first thing he says is to gird your loins with truth. Put on a belt of truth, a girdle of truth. He says, make sure it's fastened tight as it will. Truth is that first element. He says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. He says, make sure on your feet, your feet are shod. You are, have on your feet the preparation of the gospel of peace. Then take the shield of faith, above all, taking the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Over the past few weeks, we dealt with the first four, truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, and faith. And today, brothers and sisters, we put in on our helmets. It's called the helmet of salvation. So now when you think about a helmet, you know that the helmet protects the head, correct? And I think this is obvious. I think of all the pieces of the armor, it's absolutely obvious what the helmet protects. It protects your head. 
And this helmet, as pictured by Paul, was, uh, of course, the, the picture we have is a, is a Roman soldier. And his helmet was made of a thick type of leather. And then there was a metal overlay um, on it so that it would have been uh, 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 padded with leather. And then there's a metal overlay. Some of them looked kind of attractive. And they had some of them had nice flower and little gallons or something like that on it. But we don't want to focus too much on that metal object that we'll put on our head as a helmet. Because that's not what Paul really wanted us to focus on. He says, put on for a helmet salvation. And when we talk about a helmet, we said that a helmet protects what part of the body? And in your head, you have your brain. But even more than that, the head in this context represents your mind. And he says here that the, that which is going to protect your mind is what? Come on. Salvation. He says, put on the helmet of salvation. So we want to understand what is this helmet of salvation and how can salvation protect us in terms of our mind, in terms of our thinking. When we talk about our head, our mind, we recognize, brothers and sisters, that this mind really and truly is the, is the, the seat of thought. It's the seat of reasoning. It's the place that we actually have our imaginations. This is what goes on in our mind, not so? We are thinking, we are imagining, we are perceiving things. This is what happens in our mind. And what we are saying is that there is a need for us to protect this, for us to hear this, guard our minds. Amen? So we want to see what it is that God has said can help us, or why is it necessary for us to protect our minds. Now, one of the things that the enemy tries to do, right, is to affect our minds. He tries to get into our thinking. I have long learned that while God speaks to the heart to get to your head, the enemy speaks to your head to get to your heart. So God ministers, first of all, from your heart, and he allows you now to, to start thinking differently based on the convictions of your heart. But the enemy gets to your mind to try to have you thinking differently for him to position himself in your heart. So that we need to understand how to protect. Now, the enemy has been working on people's minds for a long time. And he tries. In fact, what he does, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, you could probably glance with me there. He says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are what? Are lost. In whom the God of this world hath done what? Blinded the minds. Of them which believe not. He blinds minds so that people will believe not. And if you get that. So his effort is to try to cause people not to be able to think rightly of God. So he affects their mind. He blinds their mind so that they will not be able to believe. And those who don't believe, they are actually ready to pray for him to blind their minds. So his effort is to, the effort of the de devil is really to cause our minds to be shifted so that we can be destabilized. That's his effort. He wants to destabilize us by trying to affect our minds negatively. But God has given us a defense. Amen? Woo! In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, you can turn with me to this one. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He says here, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the what? Pulling down of strongholds. Now, what did he say is not carnal? The weapons of our warfare. So what he's saying is this, that the weapons, that which we fight with, is not carnal. When we talk about carnal, it's not fleshly, it's not physical, it's not this natural thing. What we are fighting with, and, and we have to understand this, brothers and sisters. This is why, um, you know, the word of God is important. When we are fighting spiritual warfare, you can't take a broom to go and beat devil. You understand? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But what? They are mighty through God to the what? Pulling down of strongholds. And then what? Casting down of what? 
So what we are seeing is this, that what God has given us is weapons for warfare. And what he's saying is that the weapons that we have, they are not carnal, they are not physical, they are not fleshly, they are not fleshly motivated. The weapons that we have are strong, they are mighty through God. They are mighty how? It is through God that we have the strength or the might. Remember when we started this series in Galatians, we says that finally, brethren, be strong in the what? In the Lord and in the what? Power of his might. Our strength is not in our own selves. Our strength is in God. And this is why he says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are what? Mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And the what? Casting down of imaginations. We can tumble down imaginations with the weapons that God has given us. That's powerful. Amen? Long time I hear all they say amen, boy. Oh, good. That sounds so good. Feeling like a preacher today. So he says here, that a weapon. So we have this, th these weapons that, we, that God has given us. And he says they are, not, um, they are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. So God has given us, he has prepared us now with something that we can use. And when we are talking about our minds, that which helps us to cast down the imaginations, that which helps us now to pull down strongholds, that which helps us now to be able to enter into a place of victory in Christ Jesus in terms of our mind being protected is called salvation. Say salvation. So we protect our mind with salvation. He says the helmet of salvation. Now the objective of the armor, remember what was the initial objective that we identified the armor as? The objective of the armor is to help us, to equip us to do what? Stand against the devil's devices. This is what he, is, this is what he gave us this, uh, this uh, to do. So that now when we, we're talking about this mind being protected with salvation, we must recognize that the purpose that this salvation that we are going to be talking about is given is to help to protect us to stand in our minds. I don't know if you get that. Because that's the effort the enemy wants to destabilize our thinking as well. So now what is this salvation that he's talking about? It's interesting that over the last, uh, um, about a few months ago, I taught a series on the greatest need of man being what? You all remember what I said the greatest need of man is? Salvation. And in that series, I shared with us an understanding as what salvation really is. And I identified that there are four major aspects of salvation, four major components that we looked at as salvation. You all remember by chance what it is? I know it was a long time. Regeneration. Justification. Sanctification. And glory. What? Give yourselves a round of applause. Yeah. So we said that. So now we're going to be looking at three aspects of that same thing that we looked at. Because what happens is that salvation addresses past, present, and future. So that when we talk about salvation, is that we have been saved. How many of you all have been saved? Yes. So when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we received the grace of salvation. We have been justified by God through the work of Christ Jesus. So we have been saved. But then we understand that salvation is an ongoing process as well. So we are being saved. And that sanctifying work is God's Holy Spirit actually saving us. But then we also said that there is a future aspect of salvation that we call glorification. You all remember that? And we said that at that time, we're going to be saved from the presence of sin totally and completely. Because God is going to glorify us. We're no longer going to be in this earthly state. We are actually going to be glorified. And this body is going to be changed. It's going to be transformed. This is what the apostles say, the corruptible shall put on incorruption. And when Paul is talking about here now, this, this perspective of the helmet of salvation, it is not the past tense salvation that he's talking about. It's not even the present tense salvation. 
Let's go to our, pa our passage to help us to understand this a little more. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 5. Say, God help the preacher. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. What does it say? Read it with me, please. But let us who are of the day be what? Sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the what? For a helmet, the what? For a helmet, the what? Hope of salvation. So when we are talking about the helmet of salvation, it is not just for us being saved. Because in fact, as I said before, what Paul is doing, he's writing to people who are already saved. So it's not for us to now go and look for salvation. It is that we have already been saved, but there is a future hope of salvation that we are looking towards. So when we talk about putting on the helmet of salvation, it's really speaking about that hope for salvation or that hope of salvation. And this is an important part of our faith, brothers and sisters, because part of, our, of us, um, in fact, a very essential aspect of our faith is hope. Do you know that? What is the definition you know of faith? Anybody can tell me? Shout it out. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is what? Of things what? Of things what? So faith is the substance of things hoped for. So that if there's no hope in, then there's no faith in. <laughs> is, that, is that correct? I know we have a few teachers here. If there's no hope, then there's no faith. Because faith is the substance of things that is hoped for. And what we are hoping for is that eternal glory that God has promised us. So that what we are looking forward to, brothers and sisters, that need to guard our mind is this assurance of that eternal glory. Having come to the saving grace of Jesus Christ, there's a promise for eternal glory. Having come to this uh, saving grace of Jesus Christ, there's a promise that we will enter into glory. We shall be glorified in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. The trump of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and then we that are alive shall be caught up to meet him in the air. This is our hope. Jesus Jesus says he went to prepare a place for us that where he is, there we will be also. He says this is a hope for us. So when we talk about the helmet of salvation, it's this assurance, brothers and sisters, in our future hope. You see, what happens, brothers and sisters, is that the enemy is going to try to destabilize our faith. Why? Because he knows that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And if it is that he can get us to not be sure of our salvation, to not be sure of what God has done, to not be sure of that promised eternity, he is going to whip us daily going and coming. Because you know what? He's going to get us to fall. Because if you know, hear this. If you know that the devil is already defeated and that your place is secure in heaven, all these things that we're going through here, we're going to realize that all things work together for what? Good to whom? Them that love God and they that are the call according to his purpose. So that even though I go through a little stress, I know one day that's going to stop. I know even though I may face uh, trials and somebody may knock me down, I'm not out. The other day, my wife was watching um, the Rocky Balboa. And he get knocked down, boop, 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 but he was not out. You understand what I'm saying? And we had to have that kind of rocky faith. That even though we are faced with challenges, brothers and sisters, we can continue to stand on what there's a hope of salvation. And that protects our mind. When we talk about hope, brothers and sisters, where the hope is defined as that favorable, confident expectation. Expectation, trust, confidence, desire, anticipation. 
in this context that we are speaking of, the joy and confident expectation of eternal salvation. We have this expectation and it creates a joy in us that one day we will see the Lord. The, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul continues in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19. He says, if in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. You know what that means? It simply means that our hope is not just in this life alone. You know, some people talk about, you know, the material things and these physical things and all these things. If that's all we are hoping for, we just like the other people. In fact, we're more miserable than the other people. You ever see some grumpy Christians? Oh my gosh, I hate to see a grumpy Christian. I got baptized somewhat since 1994. You could do the maths. <laughs> and when they baptized me, they didn't baptize me in lemon juice. You understand? It's not lime juice they dipped me in. I don't know why some Christians always so sour. What I realize, brothers and sisters, is looking onto Jesus creates a, a sense of joy on the inside of me that I can laugh I, in spite of what I go through. There's a joy that is on the inside of me because of the expectation that is there. You see, when you, what happens is this. The opposite of hope is hopelessness. Not so? It creates despair. It creates depression. So that when an individual is not uh, walking in that hope, then you find within them that there's a lot of despair and they're depressed. And you know what? They rub it off on you. There are some people you pass by them and spiritually it's like lagly. They just grip you and you, you know, you like it. And what we had to do is to recognize that the hope that we have in Christ Jesus keeps our focus on something more than just this life. If this is all we have, we're miserable. And some people say, you're miserable with what you have. But guess what? I tell people, hear this now. You see the suffering of this world? It cannot compare with the joy that is to come. You understand? So we have hope, brothers and sisters. And we must be able to recognize that this work that God is doing is bringing us into a greater hope. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter, chapter 2, verse 11 to 13. Ephesians 2, 11 to 13. He says here, Wherefore, remember that he being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcised by the, that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time he were, what? Without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But, <laughs> underline that word, circle that word, but now in Christ... Jesus, but now in Christ Jesus, he who sometimes were, up, were far off are made nigh by the what? By the blood of Jesus, of Christ. He's saying here, in times past, there were three withouts that you had. You were without Christ, you were without hope, and you were without God in this world. That is a classic case of hopelessness. You don't have Christ, you don't have hope, and you don't have God while you're in this world. That is pressure. That is what they call more pressure. You understand what I'm saying to us? So what we have to realize is that if it is that we are without Christ, we are without hope. If you're without God, you're without hope. We have the only form, the only way that we can have genuine hope is if we keep our focus on understanding that we are in Christ. We are no longer outside of Christ. And once you are in Christ and you have God, then you have hope. And this is where this message of the helmet of salvation comes in, in that we must know of our assurance. We must understand our assurance in Christ Jesus to give us that eternal hope. 
Because it's only when you don't have Christ, you don't have hope. Because our eternal salvation is based on our relationship with Christ. And this is why we have to be in Christ. And who um, the apostle was writing to were people who were already in Christ. Look what he says, in, look what the apostle John says, 1 John chapter 5, verse 10 to 13. First John 5, 10 to 13. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness where? In himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. What is the record? God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. And he that hath the son hath what? Life. He that hath not the son hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God. Underline the next part of it. That you may know that he have what? Eternal life. And that you may believe on the name of the son of God. Of God, So he is writing this so that you will know that you will what? That you have eternal life. This is the hope that we have. This is the expectation. This is the anticipation that because of God's love for us, we who have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior have eternal life. I want to tell you a bit about eternal life. Just permit me a, a, a minute or two on this. Eternal life is something that began now. Ooh. You didn't get that? Because what happens is this. Because we have eternal life, we shall never die. But we will pass from this life onto life. I wonder if you get what I'm saying. This is the hope that we have. Because we have accepted Christ as our Lord, we, the eternal life begins now. When we spoke about regeneration, we have been regenerated. We have come alive so that you are alive now. The spirit that is on the inside of you came alive by the power of the spirit of God. And because you are alive spiritually, when you die physically, you just translate from this life onto a next life. I wonder if you get what I'm saying to us. That it is a promotion that you get. This is why we call it glorification. So that you as a believer, you move now into glory. Jesus. My God. So that this eternal life, this is the promise that we have. So our effort is so that we can know. So that we can what? You see why this is important because what the enemy does, he creates imaginations in our mind that you'll go to hell, that you have been condemned, that you are going to be um, cast out. He creates these imaginations in our mind. And what we have to understand, brothers and sisters, is that we must have this security in our hearts and our minds so that we don't be destabilized and be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Because people don't understand their salvation, they run to this church, they run to this religion, they run to all of these places because of the fact that they have not yet understood their experience with God or their receiving God really and truly is bringing them into that place of eternity. Over the last couple of weeks, I've heard about several ministers. Somebody shared a chat, a, a, a text with several ministers who were preaching the gospel and they fall away and they abandon the faith. A few years ago, I heard of a prominent um, gospel minister who sang songs like Behold the Lamb and the Anchor Hold and all these powerful anthems of the faith. And then you hear after uh, uh, about uh, uh, eight to ten years ago, you hear him coming out of the closet. After 30 something years of marriage. I wonder if you understand what I'm saying. 
When we understand our eternal hope, we don't get tossed to and fro. You're able to stand stable in the things of God because of the fact that your mind is secure. You see what he says, a double-minded man is unstable. This is why when he talk about this whole perspective of security in him, he starts with, with this concept of sobriety. We have to be sober. Sobriety speaks about alertness of mind, soundness of mind. And what brings that soundness of mind, brothers and sisters, is our understanding of our security in God. Our understanding. Now, I'm not a preacher of once saved, always saved. So be careful with that. Because there's a thin line between what I'm sharing and the concept that once saved, always saved. But we must understand that we are secure in Christ. The one saved, always saved doctrine is saying that you, no matter what you do, you're still going to remain in Christ. I don't believe that. But I do believe that once you are in Christ, you must know that you are solidly in Christ. And that you're going to follow based on your knowledge of who Christ is and your relationship with Christ. What is going to happen is that life is going to follow. The word of God declares, he that does righteousness is righteous. So that we as believers, we're going to respond to God based on our relationship to him. He has called us out. And that whole projection, this whole perspective as to what we are doing in Christ has to be on the basis of our soundness of mind based on our hope in salvation. Let me see if I can bring this down to us. Romans chapter 8 verse 31. When you have it, say Amen. What does it say? What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, no, no, that, you see, that verse is a verse we read with attitude. You understand? What shall we say to this? If God be for me, <laughs> how did this do it? <laughs> if God be for me, who can be against me? This is what he's saying here. And look what he says. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, right? How, uh, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? All what? All things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that what? Now hear this. This is important. Because this is basically what we're talking about. Who can lay something against your charge when God is the one who justifies you? You know what justifies me? You all remember what justify means? You have been declared righteous. So now who can come and tell you that you're not righteous when God already tell you you're righteous? Who could come and condemn you when the word of God says there's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk after the spirit and not after the flesh? Who can lay anything against the charge of God's elect? Are you elect of God? Well, that's the next question. The election is a very important concept of salvation. It talks about God actually preordaining or predestining those persons who will be saved. And we now respond to that call. When God says to you, I want you, you respond. You ain't running the next way and running the next way. You respond to God. And that response, brothers and sisters, bring us, it ushers us into this place. Whereby we now stand in the courtroom and he says, not guilty. Why not guilty? Because of the things that you have done? Because of your good looks? Because of your good works? Because of the law that you have done? No, not guilty. Because my son paid the price for him already. That is why we are determined not guilty. So that you have been justified. So the righteousness that was on Christ is now placed on you. So now who can come and tell you? That you're not making it. Who can come and tell you that you are not good? Who can come and tell you that you are unrighteous? Who can come and tell you anything? The devil is an accuser of the brethren. So this is why we need to have our helmet of salvation. Because of the fact that when he comes and accuses you, you can reflect to the fact that, hey, I am saved and I know that I am. You understand? 
when he comes to accuse you, you can stand and remind him about what Revelation say, that I will make it. And he, there's a place for you, you know. There's a place, tell him that there's a place for him. You see, when we talk about all this, what God does, and people talk about why does God allow this and why here, God already knows what the end is going to be. You understand? From the time Adam sinned, God already made provision. So those things that really and truly all that happens in between this is just God allowing the enemy to have his way or whatever, but it, it is already determined that he shall, the devil, the antichrist, the false prophet, hell, and the grave, all have a place in the lake of fire. Every single one. And those who follow them. So who shall lay anything against the church of God's elect? Mm -mm. Who is it that condemned it? It is Christ that died here. Rather, is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God. Who also make it intercession for us. Look at this next part. Hey, I like this. Read it for me, verse 35. Anybody qualified to separate me from the love of my Christ? Anybody qualified? Who shall separate me from the love of Christ? Shall, hear it? Shall tribulation? Or what? Or distress? Or persecution? Or famine? Or nakedness? Or peril? Or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed, we are killed all the day long. And we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. But nay, in all things, we are through what? Not in our own strength. We are more than conquerors through him that what? Loved us. For I am persuaded. Look at it. For I am what? I am convinced. I am persuaded. That what? Come on, hear me. I am persuaded. Shout it out that neither. No, 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 shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Remember, when we're talking about this armor that God has equipped us. To fight against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places and rulers of the darkness of this world. He is saying that none of these things can separate me. Why? Because I am secure in God. He said we must know this. So that this assurance that we have brothers and sisters is that even though things may come against us. These things that come against us cannot separate me from the love of my God. Turn with me to John. I think this might be my last scripture. God help us. You want me to lock up? <laughs> John 10, 27 to 29. <laughs> he says, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. And I give unto them what? Jesus. <laughs> Look what he says here. My sheep know my voice. I know them and they do what? Those who are the sheep of God, they do what? They follow Christ. He says, my sheep know my voice. You see, we have to understand, brothers and sisters, that what the enemy tries to do he speaks so loud in our air to cause us not to hear the voice of God. To cause us not to hear that warmness of the Father's voice that says to us, you are my child. He says, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. Do you know why we sin? Anybody knows why we sin? Because we are sinners. And the enemy continues to speak to us to move in a direction away from God. And you know what we do? We obey that voice. 
we obey that voice. And what we are saying is this, that the Lord is telling us now, my sheep know my voice, and they do what? Follow me. And look what I'm doing. I give unto them what? Eternal life. And look what he says here. And they shall what? Jesus. What's that? They shall never perish. Neither shall any man My father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to do what? Pluck them out of my father's hand. You see, when you are in the hand of God, brothers and sisters, no devil in hell could come and take you out. I wonder if you understand what I'm saying to us. So that we must understand that when we are in Christ, we are secure. When we are in Christ, we are in the father's hand. And no devil could come and take you out of the Lord's hands. That level of security, brothers and sisters, that is not blink vigilance. That is not saji. Um, what, who, who it is? G4, what, what? G4, what? G4 security or amalgamated or, or SWAT. That, no, no. <laughs> this is God Almighty. You understand? You want bodyguard? This is bodyguard, no? What's the name? Kevin Costner. Yeah. Not Kevin Costner. You want bodyguard? This is bodyguard. I wonder if you understand what I'm saying to us. He says that when we are in his hand, nobody, no man can come and take us out. And this is the level of security that we have that protects our mindset so that we can now have this hope for eternity because we are secure in Christ. So that the enemy, no matter what he says, cannot create doubt in our heart because we are already positioned rightly with God. And no matter what he tried to do, we have been kept. One of the most powerful testimonies that I can hear anybody stand and say, he kept me. This whole perspective of us having a whole set of different experiences outside of Christ and then, you know, they nearly kill me and then I nearly get AIDS and I nearly get this and I nearly get that. What about the testimony? He has kept me. Come on. Because we understand, brothers and sisters, that the presence of God is more powerful. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And all that we have and all that we go through and experience, brothers and sisters, must come back down to the fact that we can stand assured in our salvation in Christ Jesus. If you have fallen, get back up. If you have missed the mark, get back up. You don't have to remain down and out. Why will you remain down and out? No. If you have come to that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, know that he can keep you. He, you are safe in his hands. And that is what we stand with in terms of our minds being protected. The helmet of salvation, brothers and sisters, is this assurance of that future hope. That we can stand knowing, brothers and sisters, that one day we shall see our Lord. We shall be part of that new city that is going to be built, that, that's going to come down from heaven. We're going to walk that street of New Jerusalem, and we're going to be in the presence of our true and living God for eternity. This is the assurance. This is that helmet of salvation that creates the assurance. And the enemy, he cannot touch us once we continue to know that we are in the things of God. Don't fall away, brothers and sisters. Continue to stand. Having done all to stand, stand in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Father, we give you praise. We thank you, dear God, for your word and for what you have said to us and how we can stand in this assurance knowing that you are God and besides you there is no other. Tonight, today, dear God, we stand, Lord Heavenly Father, recognizing you as Master and Savior and God. And we look forward to that future hope. 
when you, Lord Heavenly Father, will call us home, that future hope where we will stand, Lord Heavenly Father, the eastern skies will burst, the trump of God shall sound, and we shall be taken. We look forward to that, that future hope, dear God Heavenly Father, that we will be reunited with you, dear God, because we have been reconciled with you. Father, we look forward to that future hope, dear God, that we can stand, Lord, as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, having been glorified, whereby the things that we once, that, 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 that uh, were once part of our lives, that those uh, forms of unrighteousness is going to be, uh, it, it's going to be taken away, dear God, because we stand in your presence. And Father, we look forward to this future hope, whereby we can stand before the throne of the true and the living God, and to be able to worship you truly in spirit and in truth. Father, we thank you for what you are doing and what you are about to do, and this assurance that you have given us for salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.